Okay guys, welcome to another episode of Raising the Bar and today I have with me for a second time uh, Simon Webb, author Simon Webb, prolific author Simon Webb and um, by public demand we brought Simon back on because we had such tremendous comments, such tremendous feedback from you guys uh, and the, 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 the work that Simon's done and the, the, the stuff that we haven't been taught at school basically and um, Simon's very brave in the way that he um, researches stuff and puts stuff out there and uh, he isn't sort of, there's no veneer of political correctness with Simon he just wants to find the truth and share the truth and uh, I think that's why I resonate with Simon and so many of you did as well and uh, today Simon I wanted to bring you back on because um, I thought we could maybe go into, into, into the depths of uh, Africa and maybe talk about, you mentioned before about the Khoisan and the Bantu and I think this is something that's a complete blind spot for a lot of people. Um, would you mind, uh, firstly, welcome to the show. <laughs> Hi there. Uh, and I thought, how about, Simon, where do you think we should start with this? Should we start with the Khoisan and, and, go, and start back with the, you know, the, the first inhabitants of Earth and, you know, the well, first Homo sapiens? Yeah, we could start generally just thinking about Africa a little bit, perhaps, okay. because often we think of Africa as being just an amorphous mass. People say Africa and they think, oh, yes, that's where there's a lot of black people. And that's about the limit of it. But of course, Africa is a very large place and it's more complicated in many ways than Europe. We wouldn't uh, dismiss people as European. There's all the difference in the world between, say, Germans and Italians and Scottish people and Welsh people and Swedish people. And it's exactly the same in Africa. It's divided up into different nations, different uh, ethnic groups, different tribes. So that's the first thing that we have to realise. So even if we talk about, for example, Nigeria, we've got to realise that that's split up into different groups. In the north, you have the Husa, uh, who are Muslim. And then in the south, you have the Yoruba and the Igbo, who are generally Christian or animists. So that's one thing I think we've got to get straight to begin with. Mm -hmm. The other thing we need to bear in mind is that Africa wasn't always occupied by what we think of as typical sub-Saharan Africans, black people. Um, if you think about people from Cameroon or Nigeria, that's really our image of an African, isn't it? You know, the, the typical black African. It wasn't always like that in Africa at all. In fact, there used to be at least four or five different ethnic groups in the continent, and most of them got squeezed out one way and another, um, chiefly by the Bantu. Um, let me try and uh, draw a parallel here. You probably know about the Indo-Europeans. So what happened was, that originally in Europe, there were lots of little groups and ethnic groups and tribes all over the place speaking various languages. And in India, there was the same thing. There were uh, various groups. For some reason, a big group of people called the Indo-Europeans started, get, they got going in the Ukraine and they started moving out. They moved into Europe and they moved into um, India as well via Iran and Afghanistan. And so today, we speak Indo-European languages. We speak languages based upon those conquerors, the Indo-Europeans. But the reason I'm mentioning them is this. When they moved it anywhere, the first thing they did was to kill everybody that got in their way and make slaves of the rest. So when they moved into Europe, uh, they practically destroyed the native inhabitants there, including Britain. All, all our genes now are really Indo-European genes. As soon as the Indo-Europeans hit Britain, they killed everybody they could get, apart from some women that they kept to breed from, and they made slaves of people. That was about 3,500 BC. The same thing happened with the Bantus. There were, in Africa originally, say um, about 2,500 BC. In the north, you had the Berber, who were fairly light-skinned. They're the original inhabitants of North Africa. And you also had pygmies living in the rainforests. You had the Khoisan living in East Africa and South Africa. And then you had some very dark skinned black people living in Central Africa, round about what's now Southern Nigeria and Cameroon. Mm. And just like the Indo-Europeans, these people started to move out of their homeland. They, they 
were using agriculture. They were chopping trees down and planting yams, and they were a very vigorous culture. And they gradually moved into the rest of Africa over the course of thousands of years, and they displaced the people that were already living in the areas that they moved to. Okay, because this is, I remember we talked about this before, and I actually mentioned this to some, some people, you know, and I mentioned the Bantu, and I mentioned the Bantu exterminating um, the rest of Africa, yeah. you know, um, with, well, also probably, and the pygmies as well, I think you mentioned. Um, they were they kept eating them pygmies babies. less than 20 years ago, according to the yeah. UN. The, uh, in Congo, there was a civil war, and they, they've not only enslaved the pygmies, they're actually eating them, but carry on. Oh, oh my goodness. OK, but OK, let's, if we can just go back. So we're, we're the, if the Hoysan was the first indigenous, uh, you know, peoples of Africa or the world, yeah. let's say, then how did how did black people come about? I know that sounds a bit of a silly question, but how, it's how not did a silly question at all? How did, no, their, how did their unique genes come about if it wasn't directly from uh, the Because Hoysan? If, you live, if you live long enough near the equator, having black skin is an advantage. It means you won't get skin cancer and you won't get sunburn. So the Hoysan lived further south in South Africa, which is more temperate. Right. People living right by the equator in equatorial Africa, like the Pygmies and the Bantu at that time, turned black because there was an advantage to it. There's disadvantages. You don't get as much vitamin D, but there's a lot of advantages. You know, you can put up with the heat more. So okay. that's the advantage of becoming black if you live in equatorial Africa. So they have um, evolved from the Hoysan to become the Bantu through their genetics? Essentially, yeah. Essentially, black people in Central Africa did evolve that way. And the Hoysan didn't. They stayed generally more uh, south of the equator. So it wasn't so important for them to be black. And how do we know that the Hoysan were, I remember you saying pale skin before, but you know, more, I would say more, you would say like Oriental Asian skin. Yellow, yellowish, yeah. They yeah. yeah. How, how do we know that? How, how can we actually do, um, provide sort of evidence for that? You know, in a DNA. Time? All, all the DNA tests. Yeah, they suggest that they were the Aboriginal inhabitants of uh, Africa and that they're the oldest human stock. They look more Oriental. You know, they have the epicanthic eye fold, what we would call slanty eyes. Um, you know, Nelson Mandela was partly Khoisan. And if you look at Nelson Mandela's face, he doesn't look like a black, black person, like someone from Equatorial Africa. His skin is paler, slightly yellowish. And if you look at his eyes, you can see the remains of an epicanthic eye fold. You can see that he's of different stock, say, from uh, a Nigerian. Mm. And someone else also mentioned to me about the, the hoist. And they said they, even though we say that they had pale skin, they still had nappy hair, which suggests that they were more black than they were white. What do you yeah, say? there was a lot of interbreeding. That's because this is what conquerors do. If, mm. if, if you move into an area, when the, when the Indo-Europeans invaded Europe, they wanted to kill the men because they were a threat. But no one wants to get rid of uh, available women. So mm. it's exactly the same with the Bantu. They would kill any men that opposed them. And then they would breed with the women. People, mm. Most um, invaders do that. You know, rape is something that, that happens all the time with invaders. So, so yeah, it's an awful lot of black heritage there. Uh, the Hoysan probably had sort of European hair then, like fair, like Vision fine. is quite entirely possible, yeah, but we don't know. It's exactly. impossible to look at ancient DNA and right. work out accurately what colour skin was, what type of hair there was. It right. can, only, can only do it on estimates statistically. So they don't really know if they were pale skin then, it's just an estimate. Yeah, well, we know that the, the purest, the, the ones with the purest DNA now are pale and yellowish rather than black. Right. Okay. Oh, so there's some that actually kept their lineage, like their genetic. There's some with more. Yes. Yeah. There, there are some that are more uh, pure than others, certainly. Okay. That's really, really interesting. Um, okay. So let's let's do a little chronology here. So the Hoysan, they were the first two, um, well, the first known um, Homo sapiens on Earth. Um, That's right, yeah. And, uh, and they occupied the whole of Africa, or did you say they... They occupied Africa? mostly South and East Africa. You know where Tanganyika is today. The Khoisan uh, extended that far. And they were the ones that originally crossed over uh, into Europe and Asia via the Sinai Desert. 
Okay, and so I'm guessing they were hunter-gatherers at that time? They were hunter-gatherers, yeah, and some yeah. still are. They're okay. still with the gatherers. And then what must have happened is um, some of the Hoysan settled in um, West Africa, and um, that's what... And then It's I'm entirely sure. possible, though we can't be sure of that, yeah. No. But at any rate, the Bantu, two and a half thousand years ago, started to move out. They found pygmies living in equatorial Africa, yeah. and they either enslaved them or killed them. And then as they moved further east and south, they encountered the Khoisan. And they did the same thing there. They killed or enslaved them. Mm. And so now Africa is effectively being colonized by the Bantu, who were the tribe that started where Cameroon, Cameroon is and um, southern Nigeria. But just as the Indo-Europeans did in Europe and India, mm. they were very vigorous people, very warlike people, and they took over. Mm. And uh, well, they take and the, the whole of Africa has been taken over effectively, right? Because yes, yeah, that's what we mean by sub-Saharan Africans. Now we mean black people. Yeah, we we mean typical Bantus. Yeah, that's what we mean. Yeah, okay. Um, all right. So where where should we now move to in the chronology? So we're not skipping over too much important information. Um, so we so w at what point in history are we now where the Bantu have uh, round about round about say the time of Christ round about you know zero AD if you okay. might put it zero. so the Bantus have taken over most of Africa by that time not most South Africa South Africa they didn't arrive until roughly the same time as white people okay. you know the, uh, the the Bantu and the South Africans the, the white South Africans both arrived roughly at the same time on the Cape, and then they both started to kill off the Hoysan if they could. Uh, right, so the Hoysan were in South Africa, and then around, didn't you say it was like the 16th century or something like that? Yeah, that's right, yeah, yeah, when the white people arrived, but the Bantu were edging towards South Africa and the Cape at the same time. Isn't that amazing, though, that, that Africa, they're there for thousands of years, and then they only discovered South Africa, like, quite almost quite recently? Things like that are a slow process. Yeah. It, you know, I mean, when people, when a people like that are gradually expanding, it doesn't happen overnight. Once you yeah. settle a place, you wait for a while, and then your children get a little bit restless and want their own home, so they start moving on. Yeah. It might happen to, you know, to, uh, I don't know, 10 miles a century or something like that. It's a very slow process. All right, so let's can we let's talk about South Africa then. So um, you said that the the Hoi Sand were there, and then the Bantu and white people arrived at roughly the same time. That's right. Yes, and there was a lot of competition there, mm -hmm. and the Hoi Sand got squeezed out by both groups. But the Hoi Sand regard themselves as the original inhabitants. They there's a, a movement among the Hoi Sand in opposition to the Bantu, to the black people that are running South Africa. Mm -hmm because they feel that they're being neglected. They feel that, that, that the, they regard the Bantu, the black South Africans, as invaders still. I mean, they're pushing for reparations, and uh, there's a lot of uh, havoc going on there with the, the killing of white farmers. And, there um, certainly is, yes. But effectively, neither of them have true claim to the land. Yeah. So it's actually the Hoi San that are hard done by, and uh, <laughs> yeah. if anything, they That's... have the most claim to the land. That's right, yeah. Yeah, OK. So they were squeezed out. So I think you mentioned before that they were they were pushed out. Some of them were kept as slaves. A lot of them were exterminated. Yeah. Um, and then I'm guessing there was some kind of, uh, you know, an, 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 an alliance between the, the white people and the black people where they they agreed not to kill each other or, you know, or have any kind. Of, I'm sure that it was conflict. Right? No, the white, white people had guns. The, the white people came out on top. And there was a, oh. if you've got any squabble between black people that don't have guns and white people that do, mm. the white people usually come out on top. Right. That, that's why we had a white regime in South Africa, because they were better armed than the uh, right. okay. Zulus and so on. Right. Oh, Zulus. Let's talk about Zulus. So who are the Zulus at this point? The Zulus were a Bantu nation. Right. And they, they were kicked off with the British, obviously. I mean, you, you probably know there was an Anglo-Zulu war. Mm. The British wanted to seize Zulu land, and mm. so they stole their land, and the Zulus didn't like it and fought back. And they had one glorious victory at um, Isan Luana, where they managed to wipe out a British column. And then mm. the British firepower was too much for them in the end, with them... Um, Gatling guns and so on, so the British won. Ketchwayo was exiled to London. He, he lived in London for a while. Who? 
Ketwayo, the uh, king of the Zulus at that time. Okay. I was exiled to Europe. London. Britain. He lived in London. Okay. In Kensington. All right. And uh, what, was, what was his fate in the end? Yeah, they let him go back to South Africa once, once mm -hmm. British rule had been established there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so at this point, then, let's lead up to more of the present day. So um, what do we know? What's the, what's the real truth with the, uh, with the history of South Africa from that point on and the apartheid and you know, everything else? Is it, is it as we know it in the, in the mainstream media? Is there anything that's hidden? What do you mean? Well, I mean, do we know that, presumably we do know that Mandela was a communist and that the uh, South African Communist Party, well, the, you know, he founded um, Konto Wesiswe, the Spear of the Nation, the fighting arm of the ANC. Mm -hmm. Until Mandela came along, the ANC was dedicated to peace, peaceful struggle and non-violent protest. Mm -hmm. Mandela changed that. Mandela and um, a white communist called Joe Slovo mm -hmm. founded the armed movement. So that was when the um, real trouble started, the um, fighting. Um, fighting at what, so for, for what in what context? Well, a guerrilla war, a guerrilla warfare and terrorism. Yeah, so that's the thing that, that that's a, a blind spot for a lot of people is that um, Nelson Mandela was a terrorist, right? Yeah, of course. Yes, yeah, so he, he pleaded guilty to planting bombs when he uh, went on trial in '62. Yeah, so no, no debate about that. But he received weapons training in Morocco and Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. He was. Um, trained in explosive, the use of explosives and as a rifleman. The so night we, before he was arrested, he, he was wearing combat gear and a pistol at his belt. He wasn't, he wasn't a pacifist or anything like that. Yeah, could we talk about some of his terrorist acts? But he didn't really get much chance to do all that much terrorism because, of course, he was locked up in 1962. But he was still in control of... Our, he, I mean, you know the African National Congress, the, the ANC was the organisation which he was associated. I'm going to have to look that up, actually. I'm okay. not well-versed on Africa. OK. The ANC, the African National Congress, was founded just before the First World War, yeah. and they, called, they, they were dedicated to peaceful resistance. It wasn't really what Mandela wanted. So in the late 1950s, he founded a movement called Onkonto Wesiswe, which means Spear of the Nation. And that was to be a guerrilla group, a terrorist group, if you like, mm -hmm. that would fight against by planting bombs and um, other methods against the South African regime. And it was very much uh, found. It was founded by communists. All the chief members were members of the South African Communist Party. Did you say in the, in the 1950s? Very late 50s, yeah, early 60s. I've got here, the African National Congress is the Republic of South Africa's governing political party. It's been the ruling party of post-apartheid South Africa since the election of Nelson Mandela in the 1994 election, winning every election since then. Now, if you just Google African National Congress, it will tell you that it was founded before the First World War. So, uh, oh, it actually says... Actually, says 1912. Yeah, so just two years before the First World War. That's right. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, I was thinking 50s for some reason there. Yeah, um, yeah, 1912, Bloemfontein, South Africa. That's, That's right. when it was founded. Um, and it says here, why was it founded? Its primary mission was to bring all Africans together as one people to defend their rights and freedoms. But it was actually a communist party, basically. It wasn't at that time. It was when Mandela took over. This is the whole thing. Oh, I see what you mean. It so what, used to what be an African then? nationalist. So it was an African nationalist movement in 1912. Right. And it continued that way until Mandela mm. uh, started linking up with the communists. Mandela was a communist. Right. He had uh, the man that uh, directed um, Conto was a communist, a white man called Joe Slovo. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if it seems odd to you at all that the fighting arm of the African National Congress should be a white man. It, it's unusual, isn't it? You, you would think that yeah. a black man would be in charge of a conto with this way. It was a white man, a Lithuanian called Joe Slovo. Right. Who, and he, only, he was only in that position because he was a communist. OK, so why do we think so fondly of Nelson Mandela then? Because he was an old man uh, when he was released and he had a twinkly smile and he looked like Father Christmas. 
But no, that's essentially it. <laughs> but there must be more to that. I mean, there, we um, we revere this man, you know, like he, he's seen as um, a, a bit of a ledge, you know, a bit of a legend. <laughs> Why? But he's a communist, he's he a terrorist. Involved. I mean, he was a terrorist that didn't actually commit any terrorist acts, I think. He, he was involved with planting bombs and electricity pile, and he pleaded guilty to that. Oh, so he kind of orchestrated it, but, you know, he, he was part of the orchestration. And of he did from prison as well. He was coordinating it. Uh, right. He found it on Compton, but they carried on attacks. It, they killed more Africans than they did white people. They were doing things really? like planting landmines in the Transvaal. That killed what, uh, black workers. Why? Why did? Why were they doing that? Because often people that collaborate with um, a repressive regime are seen as traitors, and they're also seen as an easier target. You know, you you get this in all guerrilla groups. It's often a lot easier to kill unarmed civilians than it is soldiers or police officers. And That's it makes more of an impression. It gets people on your side if people get scared of you. It's, it's funny, isn't it? It's, it's really nothing to do with race in, in, in a lot of these movements it's, uh, or political organisations. It's actually more to do with ideology and yeah, uh, of course. Yeah. kill their own people just to push their own um, agenda. All um, guerrilla movements are like that. It's yeah. the same thing with the Palestinian groups in, in Israel. It, it, this is not about race. This is about how, the nature of, of politics and the nature of political power. You probably know Mao Tse, Chairman Mao Tse Tung said political power grows from the barrel of a gun. And that's very much the case. If you've got the guns, if you have the weapons, if you have the force, you're on top. Mm. Yeah, and they'd happily take out their own people is the point. Is yeah, that, course, um, yes. It's more about pushing an ideology and making sure that ideology wins at all costs. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You only had to see all the people being killed just before Mandela was released um, with the so-called necklacing. You know, if they oh, yeah. if if they suspected that someone was too close to the white authorities or was a traitor, they would burn them alive. Didn't they used to put them inside tires and then set the? They fire? put tires around their neck with petrol over them and set fire to them. Yeah, and that's why that's right. they burned alive. Yeah, mm. Mandela's wife was a great one for orchestrating that. So they were responsible for. A lot of deaths, then, like yes, like, of course, yeah, hundreds of deaths. Is that fair, or thousands? Or? Yeah, no, that's perfectly fair. But then all guerrilla groups are. Uh, that's not. It, 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 there's nothing special about the way that the ANC behaved. That's just how guerrilla groups behave when they're fighting a government. What about the rest of Africa at this point? Should we maybe talk a little bit about um, the slave trade that's still going on? Yeah, of course. No, there's no problem with that. Yeah, if you. Um, the very important slave business, slave trade and a very mm. important base of slavery is uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, mm -hmm. because that's an historic thing. That, that's been going on now for hundreds and hundreds of years. Mm. The pygmies are kept as slaves, most of them, by the Bantu in the Democratic oh. Republic. I feel a bit sorry for these pygmies because it seems like they've had a really rough ride. Yeah, they really have had a rough ride. They're still getting it as well. Because they're, they're, they are hereditary slaves, so it's not a question of so much buying and selling. They're kept like pets. If, if a pygmy child is a slave automatically by virtue of being born into a slave family. And um, is this just because genetically they're not, not big enough to, uh, to, to, to kind of um, to resist, to, to, you know, um, to fight back? Is, that, is it because I think, they're I think it's just an, I think it's just an historic thing. The fact is that you know if, if, if slavery is going on and people don't fight very hard against it, it'll continue to go on. Right. Okay. Yeah. They just got the they they just had the upper hand on them from other tribes. Yeah, they have done for hundreds of years, yeah. certainly. Same. Oh, I want to start a movement to free them or something. <laughs> you know? And so there's <laughs> there's hundreds of thousands of pygmies right now as slaves in Africa. Yes, and, absolutely. And, and underground networks as well. Yeah. Right this very moment in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Yeah. And it's, it's really interesting because that's where we get a lot of the metals that we use in our mobiles from. It's a really important country. There's a lot of cobalt there, you know, the metal cobalt, a lot of other rare metals. So yeah. 
all our mobile telephones are based upon that slavery. Anyone that has a mobile has almost certainly got minerals in it that were mined in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. That's right. one of the reasons nobody wants to start drawing attention to slavery there. Right, because okay. it's too important. People don't want to have seeing their mobiles go up in price. Imagine if the next time you bought a mobile, it doubled in price because there were sanctions against the Democratic Republic of the Congo because of their yeah. use of slaves. Absolutely, yeah. No this one wants to think works. about it. This is how the world works. The multinationals must obviously go in there and um, and uh, exploit the the, the, the the pygmies to yeah, help mine for the yeah. I don't know the lithium or whatever it is they're using. To, yeah, 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 that's absolutely right. It's too important for anybody to want to upset the apple cart. Absolutely, yeah. Well, yeah, and it's quite shocking actually. Yeah, um, that's the way that's the world works. And that's I'm, I'm guessing it's. So who would be the slave owners of the pygmies in, in let's Bantu say... Bantu there, the Bantu. The Bantu, oh, the Bantu would yeah. be, so it has nothing yeah. to do with sort of the uh, multinationals from Europe or America. No, 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 the, the Bantu keep them like pets. They yeah. pay them in used clothes and cigarettes and so on. It's a shocking business. But it, it's really ironic that when people are prepared to gather in the streets to protest about the statue of someone that may have owned slaves hundreds of years ago, they yeah. don't seem so keen to gather in the streets to protest about the Democratic Republic of Congo where there are slaves today. And the reason they don't is that they want cheap mobiles. So there's a huge amount of hypocrisy here. We could certainly buy all, all the things, the metals that we use in those phones, we could certainly buy them more expensively elsewhere. We would rather get them cheap from Africa, exploit Africa, and then turn a blind eye to the slavery. Uh, but what are they doing with the... Uh... The batteries, let's say that, or the lithium that creates the batteries and all the, the important um, components for the, for the batteries. I mean, they're still going to have to coordinate with um, the multinationals, right? Yeah, yeah, because labour's dirt cheap anyway in Africa. That's why it's it, it's handy that those minerals are found in Africa. Suppose, for the sake of argument, that all that cobalt was found here. Suppose it was in the Midlands and we had charge of it. Do you think it would be it would be as cheap for a multinational company to get it out of us as it would be out of Central no Africa? No <laughs> yeah, it's just like a free resource, isn't it? And I'm guessing the way it, it works. Yeah, absolutely. It's someone called John Perkins, who who wrote a book called um, Confessions of an Economic Hitman. And uh, he was sent into various nations uh, around the world, and he was there to corrupt the uh, the world leaders, and um, effectively get the American infrastructure companies within there, and so that they can uh, use the indigenous people to you know help um, uh, manage it, run it, and but then all the all the money would go back to America basically into these big multinational companies. And I'm guessing that's what's going to happen. That's what's happening in Africa. That's, that's exactly what's happening. happening. That's why you have 99% 99.9% in poverty and like 0.1% driving Bentley. Yeah, know? that's absolutely correct. So I'm, I'm guessing that that's the that's how it works in and using the pygmies as the ultimate low, lowest level echelon of uh, yeah, you know, because they don't need to be rock. paid at all. Right. They, as I say, they pay them in secondhand clothing and cigarettes half right. the time. No, the, the pygmies don't get any wages. Yeah. It's, so it's all it's an ideal setup for everybody. Mm. Everyone wants cheap mobiles. No one wants it. You see, you could produce mobile telephones um, in an ethical way by buying the uh, materials actually, sort of, you know, at the right cost yeah. from other countries. But it wouldn't. They, that would put your price of your phone up, and no one would buy it. You wouldn't pay twice as much for your mobile, would you? That's yeah, right. that's unfortunately the way the world works, isn't it? It that's is the way the world works. It's a sugar-coated view of how how things. Uh, work but actually it's once you scratch the surface it's it's quite ugly and um you know but it actually makes a lot of sense because if these companies just want to make it maximize their profits they're they, they're willing to do anything you know and um that's unfortunately uh how psychopathic it gets the higher up the echelons of power you go i think yeah yeah it is it really is brilliant so people that, that's are the same essentially people are the same all over the world it's not that the black people are cruel and stupid or that white people are cunning and clever or anything like that people are the same all over the world if they can if they can live for nothing or if they can rip people off you'll always find people that will do it there's, there's brutal people all over the place and yeah, greedy and cunning just, people that's just part of the human condition you're going to have it people that want to human condition. yeah you're going to have people that want to take advantage to um yeah. you know, their own gain i think that's you're never going to remove that from the human um condition are you that you're really not no um 
Brilliant. Okay, so that's the pygmies right now. So anyone watching, this is going on right now in Africa. So um, you should probably be protesting against this, considering there's like, I guess, in, probably millions of pygmies in slaves. A quarter of a million slaves there, pygmy How many? slaves. A quarter of a million pygmy slaves in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Isn't that amazing? A quarter of a million enslaved today in Africa. Yep. And then there's a guy, a statue of a guy um, from 300 years ago that's been pulled down, and that's somehow some some victory, some moral victory. I mean, the prior, get your priorities straight, do you know what I mean? Um, but I think I know why that is. Um, it's mainly because, well, I don't want to go too much into it, but I think we all know the kind of the neo-Marxist uh, philosophy that guides those people's actions. Um, which means thought, yeah, it, it was nearly all white people pulling that statue okay. down. If you look at the photograph of the statue going in the harbour, yeah. trying to find a black person, there's like one of those uh, Where's Wally books. Yeah. It's all white people. That, that's the paradox, isn't it? Like, it, it seems to me it's like, you know, and Antifa and a lot of the Black Lives Matter supporters, they're white, you know. And it's, yeah, it, it's, it's not a paradox at all. Most black people are too busy trying to get childcare or work, all yeah, sorts of shifts. Right. They're yeah. busy trying to improve their lives. It's white people, white middle class, left wing types that have the leisure to fool around putting down statues. Absolutely. Yeah, it's the champagne socialists. It's yeah, it really is. Yes. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's the ones that um, are using using these noble causes as a way to push their own ide ideologies, basically. It's like a yeah. Trojan horse and they're yeah. kind of cowering behind the image of a black man in order to push well, to, to, to create changes ideologically within and politically within the country. And That's right. To, to kind of, yeah, to, to disrupt the family, the nuclear family, as they say. They even said that on the Black Lives Matter website. They said, we aim to disrupt the, the nuclear family structure. I mean... It's in their own words, you know, what they're yeah, doing. Yeah, well, that, that's the aim of a lot of communists and a lot of Marxists. I t actually, on that, could I, could I get your opinion on Black Lives Matter? And um, can you see any parallels with Black Lives Matter and some of the other guerrilla warfare? Um, warfare yes, from yes, of course, they're all of a piece. There's a, a movement at the moment called the Black Curriculum, which right. is trying, a, aiming to bring black history into mm. the um, curriculum all year round instead of just a Black History Month. The Black Curriculum, you can Google it. Okay. And it's run, yeah, it's run by a young black woman called Stennett. So I'm on, what is the Black Curriculum? Uh, yes. The Black Curriculum .com, an education social enterprise delivering black British history in schools. Yeah, that's the one. Right, I've got here a list of the subjects uh, in their modules that they go, they're trying to promote and they want to be taught in schools, in mainstream history classes, oh, all God. year round, all students. Mm. And here's some of the modules. Cultural resistance, collectivism and solidarity, food inequality, systemic racism, activism, colonialism. That's what they want to teach. It's exactly the same. It's the same thing as the Black Lives Matter. Yeah. These are Marxist movements. Yeah. And so, what? So, the, what? What's the aim behind this then? The aim is to indoctrinate children. Yeah, and the to, aim is to indoctrinate children with a false view of history. A false view, yeah. But what? Okay, so let's talk about why you think that's false then, because um, what are they saying that's not true? Oh well, for one thing, on that site you can see a video of Mary Seacole who is the one black person everyone seems to know about from the 19th century. It's shockingly inaccurate, and they must know that it's inaccurate, and they use it to promote the idea of systemic racism in the past. Mm. You know, for example, they claim that she applied to be a nurse and her application was turned down. It's not mm. true. She never applied to be a nurse. Mm. There's a whole lot of stuff like that. They are deliberately putting forward things that they know are not true, and they're trying to push this off onto children to create a sense of grievance in children. Mm. It seems to me that they're trying to um, displace everything that's inherent, intrinsic to Western civilization. That you know, they're they're trying to disrupt and, and displace capitalism with you know socialism. They're trying to disrupt the, the, the nuclear family structure. Um, they're trying to remove Judeo-Christian -Christ um, principles. I mean, I'm not religious, but, you know, that's that's a bedrock to Western civilization. Um, they're trying to um, 
uh, separate you know fat families they're trying to um, you know create fatherless homes they're trying to get children um, nannied by the state and not by their own family I mean there's lots of things that I can see going on this seems like a communist a Trojan horse it is communism yes yeah. and there's no two ways about it the black curriculum project and the black lives matter they're, they're communist front organizations yeah. As featured in the BBC, Guardian, Metro, Telegraph, and CNN. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> there we go. All, all the yep. uh, all, all, all the usual suspects. Yeah, yes, the usual that's suspects. Correct. The only one they're missing is the Independent. I think they would have had a full house with that. Um, <laughs> but uh, wow. Okay, so that's going on at the moment. And Black Lives Matter in general. I mean, it's they don't really care about Black Lives, do they? Because I mean, that many Black people have died since George Floyd's death. And um, but they don't even get reported in the mainstream media. Well, to be honest, most black people are more likely to be killed by other black people than they are by police officers or the Ku Klux Klan. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that statistics show that. I mean, that's the biggest. Uh, yes. Racial, um, uh, that's not in dispute at all. No, that's not if you hear, if, if you look in the newspaper and you see someone's been killed in a knife attack. Yeah, half more in fact more than half the time, about eighty percent of the time, you can tell by the name it's a black person. It's yeah. black people being killed by black people, not by white racists. Yeah, and that's that is the real crisis that's going on. And uh, yeah, it is. You know, and so when it when they talk about Black Lives Matter, they should be worrying about those black lives. You know, because that's the biggest yes, um, that's the biggest demographic is um, you know black on black crime effectively. Yes. And, that's a serious, serious problem, and it doesn't want to be. Yes, it really that. is. And I think the reason for that is because that doesn't that sta that as a standalone doesn't help to further the agenda of this communist Marxist agenda of trying to disrupt the uh, disrupt and subvert Western civilization. So it doesn't really it's it's not useful enough, you know, as a as a as a as a statistic. But also people don't are so scared of being uh, called racist now mm. that they tend not to uh, draw attention to anything involving black people That's in case that they're accused of racial prejudice. Exactly. Um, for example, the, the Metropolitan Police had um, a special unit called the Trident, uh, which dealt with black gangs. Mm. And now they pretend it's not to do with black gangs. They say it's generally for gangs right. because people complain that they mentioned it was black gangs it, it's they're still dealing just with black gangs and tackling black gangs yeah but they're, they're afraid of uh, saying so now i mean it's crazy isn't it i mean like when george floyd was killed by that um cop which i suspect it might not even be true anyway that's i know that's quite controversial but i, I think it could have been staged but um let's just say let's just concede that, that he did kill him what what evidence is there that it was racially motivated, Simon? I mean, it's just a, it was just a sadistic cop being um, overly um, aggressive with uh, another person. But why? Yes. Where's the race? I suspect it would have been like that with anybody that was mouthing off and cutting up rough. Generally speaking, if a policeman stops you, if yeah. you start shouting at him and yeah. struggling and, and getting upset and excited, mm. it's not going to end well. But I mean, it was, a, it was a murder that wasn't even racially motivated, and yet it created millions of people protesting around the world. And I'm thinking, yeah. I mean, it's just crazy. And yet black people, a black cop was killed, was murdered by a BLM supporter. Um, a white woman was killed, for, was shot in the head for saying uh, all lives matter. She was murdered. I mean, they're a domestic terrorist organisation, BLM. I think you've got a point, yeah. I mean, they're no different to the suff suffragettes, right? I mean, they're just going yeah. around causing havoc. I mean, there's, there's parallels there, right? Yes, there are. But uh, like the suffragettes, there's something of a sacred cow. And if you start mm -hmm. saying anything about them, people are likely to get irate with you. Yeah. It's almost like a human shield where you're in a, you're in a gunfight and you hold up a, an innocent girl in front of you so no one's going to shoot yeah. you. It's almost like using that as it's uh, the perfect shield is to have this sort of... Um, innocent, disenfranchised, ostracised um, emblem as your shop window, so no one's going to criticise it, as you say, the sacred cow. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's actually how the political left works, I, I've noticed. They kind of do yeah. that a lot. You know. um, could, we, could we touch upon the, the transatlantic, I know it's a big topic, but I'm sure we can go through it fairly uh, swiftly, but the transatlantic uh, slave trade, can, can we have a proper lesson with this? So um, when we think about slavery, 
most people just think about the, the sub-Saharan Africans taken to America in the 16th century, um, and that's that's like our little snapshot of slavery. But um, firstly, we know that like we talked about this before in other in, in the last episodes and and this episode a bit as well. But that slavery's gone on since the history of time, and uh, yeah. every race every race has almost held every other race slave, right? And every almost every country's <laughs> Um, you know, sort of occupied occupied other lands and held those people slaves and vice versa, and it's an ongoing thing across uh, across time, right? And across uh, yeah, with the transatlantic slave trade, we didn't the white people didn't seize Africans, you know. Right. It was a triangular trade; they bought them. It, it wasn't at all the case. I mean, some people seem to have the idea that the white people went to Africa, to West Africa, and yeah. grabbed hold of black people and took them off as slaves. That's not how it worked at all. What happened was there was a very uh, lively slave trade in West Africa at that time amongst the Africans. Yeah. And when the Europeans arrived, they started to buy slaves, the people that were already enslaved by other Africans, by more powerful tribes. So the process developed that the British um, slavers would take goods from Britain down to West Africa. So things like manufactured goods, guns, yeah. uh, brassware, cloth, material, things like that. Mm -hmm. And they would use those to buy the slaves. The British didn't have, have to catch anybody. They bought slaves from other black people. Mm -hmm. And then they took them to the Caribbean and um, exchanged them, in effect, for sugar and coffee and tobacco and so on. They took so them to the Caribbean, or did they not take them to America first? Yeah, perhaps? sometimes to America, sometimes to the Caribbean. It was part of the same thing. But you've got to remember that this wasn't white people catching black people. It was white people that were trading with black people that wanted to sell them slaves. It wouldn't have worked without the Africans, without the Africans that were buying and selling the slaves. Right, yeah, OK. Yeah. And so they were then taken by the, the white slavers to um, the Caribbean, shipped off to the Caribbean. Were they shipped off to the Caribbean first or to America first? Sometimes to the Caribbean directly and sometimes to America. Oh, yes. it, it depended it depended who wanted them. And this started in the, what sort of year, around 1600s or? What, with Britain, the British involvement really didn't get going until after the English Civil War, around about the 1850s, uh, the 1650s, sorry. 1650s. There was, yeah, there was some, um, in the 16th century, there was some slight, um, you know, enterprise where people were taking slaves, but it didn't really take off as a business until after the English Civil War. What percentage of people, slaves that were taken to the Caribbean and to America were, were black and what percentage were white? Because I've I've been doing some research that there's a hell of a lot of white people taking the slaves as well. That depends on your definition of slave, I suppose. Right. Are you talking about indentured servitude? Uh, yeah, the indentured servitude. Uh, there's a lot of, yeah, there's indentured, uh, but what, wasn't it pretty much the same anyway when he boiled it down, like what they were doing or not? Or was there a big... Well, what, so let's, what's the difference between what, what they actually had to do? Because I thought that they were kind of rigged into it with the term indentured servitude by selling it as the great American dream. Um, yeah. But what was yeah, the actual you difference? You couldn't the, kill like, someone that was an indentured servant. servant. You, if, if you buy a slave, a black slave, you can do what you want. You can treat him like a domestic animal. If yeah. I buy a dog, I can kill a dog, or I can kill a cow if I buy it. Okay. The, the black slaves were actually there to be disposed of exactly as anybody wanted. Whereas the servants, the, the white people, the Irish and the Africans, their conditions of uh, service might have been rough. They might have been doing the same work as um, the black slaves, mm -hmm. but they couldn't be killed. There was a limit to how much they could be mistreated. Right. OK, so that was the difference. So just like yeah. the savagery of it. Yeah. OK. And then, so the, let's say the, uh, the slaves that were out in the Caribbean in America. So let's say the, the majority were, were black. What yeah. was, uh, how long did that actually go on for? And uh, and wasn't the first slave, I could be wrong with it, wasn't the first ever slave owner in America black? Wasn't his name J Michael Johnston or something like that? Yeah, the first, the first one we've got a record of, certainly, yeah. What was his name? I'm just going to have a look for his name. Do you know his name? I don't offhand, but I know the person you mean. It's something like John Anthony Johnston. Anthony Johnston was the first slave owner in America and he was black. Yeah. Yes, and not something the history books won't really like that much. Um, so what? And so how long did that go on for, effectively? You know, and how many and how many slaves do you think there were black slaves in America? 
during the transatlantic slave trade? There were probably, before the American Civil War, before it came to an end, there were two or three million black slaves in America. Okay. In total, about 12 million were transported across the Atlantic. But that's over the course of about 400 years. That's over 400 years. Okay. Yeah. Um, and was there any stories of people actually flourishing, at, like starting off as a slave and then ending up sort of um, working their way out of it and actually uh, becoming quite successful? Are there any sort of accounts of that? No, only if they escaped. Really? If, yeah. if, if you were a slave, if someone bought you, mm. that was it. You, you know, you remained a slave. Your children were slaves. Mm. You know, you talked about the Indo-Europeans. Yes, we know them as the Yamnaya tribe. That's yeah, only yeah. that's a Russian word because of the types of burial mounds they had. They yeah. were a tribe that were living in what is now modern day Ukraine in about 3500 BC. So, oh, you know, something like five and a half thousand years ago. And for some, they, these are the people that you know, domesticated the horse and had wheeled transport. And for some reason, they set off. They started expanding, just as Bantu did. They, one group that moved into Europe, another group headed east into India, Afghanistan, and so on. And they took with them their language. That's why, I mean, you probably do know that the Indian languages are the same group that, as English, say. Oh, so are we saying that So the Indians came from that area of Ukraine? Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. The, pe the people in northern India, the Bengalis, the yeah. Gujaratis, the Sikhs, they came, they are the descendants of the Indo-Europeans just as we are. So we had the, what was the name of this tribe from Ukraine? So we called Yamnaya, them? we call them. Yan, Yamnaya. Y-A-M-N-A-Y-A. -A -A. The people of Yamnaya. So they were from around the Ukraine area and they went yeah. west and east and they ended yeah. up settling in, in northern India, as you said. And also they, right. they came as far as to what, to England or... Yeah, as far as as far as Britain. Okay, and then you also had the Mongols that actually came into Europe. Went to sort of, I think they went to north north uh, Europe and the Scandinavia, didn't they? Yeah, like, that's much much later. That that, yeah. that was okay. about two three thousand years later. And so, why did you bring that up? I think it was to do with slavery, wasn't it? To something? show the comparison between the Bantu, because exactly the same thing happened with the Bantu. Right. For reasons that we don't know, the Bantu that were living in, around Cameroon mm. and southern Nigeria suddenly started to expand exactly as the Europeans did. They right. suddenly left their homeland and mm. decided to conquer a continent. And the Indo-Europeans conquered Europe and India and the Bantu conquered Africa. Gotcha. OK. And then how did they did they end up just uh, interbreeding to the point of washing their own culture out the window? Well, no, because we still have, as far as the Indo-Europeans go, we still have a lot of their culture in us. Mm. We still have uh, a lot of the language, a mm. lot of the myth system. Some of our fairy tales are from the Indo-Europeans. Um, mm. Fairy tales like uh, Rumpelstiltskin is about oh. 5,000 years old. Oh, right. So the Indo-Europeans have left a heritage with us. The story mm. of Cinderella is an, an old Indian story, just as it's an old European fairy tale. And so these people, where did they end up? We are them. Oh, we are. <laughs> we are the Indo-Europeans. We speak Indo-European language. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. So, what, but what, aren't we partly? So, okay. So the the Indo-Europeans also then became the Vikings, did they? Yes. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. The yeah. the Celts were Indo-European. So were the Vikings. The Indo-Europeans came into Europe and they displaced everybody mm. except, I mean, uh, the Basques living up around the uh, Pyrenees. The Basque language is the only language now in Europe which isn't an Indo-European language. So what was there before in Europe? Before um... a collection of tribes, little tribes, people. So yeah. you know, it, it wasn't as vigorous as the Indo-Europeans were. They, gave, they, they weren't as strong, they weren't as powerful. So it was just a network of little tribes, just probably much the same thing as the Bantu found when they started sweeping through Africa. OK, yeah, fascinating. Yeah, I think we got a lot in there, didn't we, Simon? Yeah, I think so, certainly. We covered, a lot, covered a lot of ground. Every time I speak to you, I feel like um, I, I've, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit clued up from the last, <laughs> from the last uh, show that we do. So um, you know, I feel like I can keep up with you a little bit more now. Whereas before I felt a little bit uh, in awe of your uh, knowledge.
I don't think you need to fill in all of my knowledge at all, John. Honestly. But no, I'm very, I'm very grateful to you. Everyone that's w watching this has been very grateful um, for your for your work. And um, you know, by public demand, they've got me, got me to get you back on. Um, I don't think there's anything less. Is there anything that we've missed out that we? No, I don't believe there is. I think we've uh, we think we've covered a lot of ground there. Yeah. Um, so I'd just like to say, Simon, you know, thanks again for coming on, and uh, you know, I look forward to coming on. Maybe we can talk about the suffragettes again. I know yeah. your book's come out recently, um, so maybe we can talk about the suffragette fascist. Sure. And um, I know that you've got a very important book coming out this October as well. So uh, that's right on slavery. Yes. So we could even, we could even do a little promo for that as well. So so that's it, Simon. Thanks very much. Okay. And, uh, we'll keep in contact with you, um, you know, over email. And uh, I look forward to seeing you, uh, you know, keeping in contact and getting you back on the show, hopefully at some point. All right. Take care then. Yeah. Take All care. Right. Bye. Yeah.